So, we're going to talk about the X-Rite Color Checker Passport and uh, they're all, no, and color checker system in general, uh, and controlling color in both stills and video. Uh, before we start, how many people here shoot stills? How many people shoot video? OK, so, and so that means some of you shoot both. Does anybody shoot only stills and not video? Anybody shoot only video and not stills? That's good. And how many people want to shoot video and stills but are only shooting stills now? All right, only a handful. So we've got a photo-heavy group. All right, so that helps me. Um, OK, so just so you get a sense of it, this is some of my work. Because when I'm seeing somebody speak, I like to have some idea of what they do. Uh, and with color, as you can see from this, correct color and neutral color are not always the same. So when you're shooting, you want to make sure that you can get the color you want. But that may not necessarily mean neutral. So with me, I always start at neutral. And then I will add a shift if I need it, if I need to warm it up or cool it down or do some other whatever. If you start from neutral, you've got more control and you can make whatever you need happen to happen. If you start with a cast and then shift to, and then try and correct that, it's very, very difficult. Make sense to everybody? And then just as a, this is some of my video. Since we're talking about video, I thought I'd toss it in there. With video in particular, I find that I like to do weird, more unusual things with color. It's a little desert heavy at the beginning. I threw it together pretty quick. But these are fun. So up here we have the export, uh, I'm sorry, the X-Rite color checker family. It's the X-Rite Color Checker Passport Photo, the Color Checker Classic, which has been around for, I believe, 50 years? 40 years. 40 years. 40, it's 40 years old this year. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the Color Checker Video and the Color Checker Passport Video. So I don't have the Color Checker Classic, but this is the Color Checker Video. We'll go over it all. This is the Color Checker Passport Video. Color checker photo. So let's talk about color a little bit. So in your camera, I'm assuming that everybody who's shooting video is using an SLR type camera or a mirrorless camera. Nobody's using a serious, crazy $80,000 pro video camera. If you are, that's awesome. I don't <laughs> use those. So in your camera, you have white balance settings, right? Auto white, daylight, flash, incandescent, usually a bunch of fluorescence, shade, custom. When you're shooting stills, if you're shooting raw, it kind of doesn't matter which of those you use, right? You shoot raw. The important thing is that you shoot this. And whatever, whatever white balance you had your camera to is fixable with this. Because the white balance with raw is just a little sidecar file that goes with the raw file. You're not changing the raw file. You're just ch telling the software how to interpret it. Does that make sense to everybody? If I say something that seems wrong, you guys can just throw up the panic flag. Um, when you're shooting video or JPEGs, the white balance you have in camera is very important. Because video is essentially like shooting JPEG. You're shooting something that's locked in. So it's correctable. You can still fix color cast with a JPEG, but it's degrading the image, and you don't have as much range to correct. Has everybody experienced that? How many of you shoot RAW? How many of you only shoot JPEG? OK, I don't have to kick anybody out. That's good. <laughs> so it still is always shoot RAW. If you want to shoot RAW plus JPEG, that's fine. But if you shoot RAW, anything can be done to fix things. When you're shooting video, you need to set your white balance. So. Shooting video, auto white, worst thing in the world. 
The reason it's the worst thing in the world is because it will change as what's in your scene changes. So if you set up a video camera, you put your camera on video on auto white, and I'm aiming at you with your green, it picks a white balance. And then I pan over here to this woman in blue, the white balance could shift a little. And you see that with video as it progresses. It doesn't stay locked into that auto white. So your options are to use one of the presets, daylight, flash, incandescent, fluorescent, shade, to lock it into something, or to use a custom white, which we'll go over. Right now, we're sort of summarizing things, and then we'll go over it. So if you use a custom white, like this, this is a spectrally neutral light, light gray with a piece of dust on it. Um, this allows you to get accurate color when you're shooting video. Every camera that's not a point and shoot will let you do custom white. You essentially shoot this. Depending on your camera, there's a setting. You tell it to pull up this frame. You say this is white or neutral, and it makes that neutral. So the camera does its magic calculations, adds some magenta, takes off some blue, does whatever to make it neutral. Uh, the reason that you want to do that is because light is not predictable. So outside, if you're in full sun, you're probably safe with daylight, probably. But the color of the daylight changes throughout the day. It also changes with the latitude. If you're further north and further south, it's different. If it's earlier in the day or later in the day, it's different. If it's a high overcast or a heavy overcast, it's different. There's a huge amount of range, even in daylight. And then inside, it's totally unpredictable. Incandescent is theoretically 3,200 degrees Kelvin with no green magenta shift. But that's assuming that it's actually true, which it only sometimes is. If you're using photographic lights, it's probably pretty close. If you went to Home Depot and you're shooting in somebody's house with incandescents, they're almost definitely not 3,200. They're in the ballpark. And then you put a dimmer on it, it's going to be warmer. If they're older or if there's you know, the color of the shade, all of those things change the color. So that's why you want a custom white balance. That makes sense to everybody? Have I convinced you? You're never ever going to use auto white for video ever? Hmm. I'm not 100% convinced, but you don't want to. Fluorescent, fluorescents are a million different colors. I've been in a lot of rooms where I've looked around and looked at all the fluorescent fixtures, and you can see to the naked eye how many different colors there are. You know, that one's a little green, that one's a little pink, that one's neutral-ish. So you can't base anything on that. All right, make sense to everybody? All right. So as I mentioned, the X-ray Color Checker Passport, one of my favorite things. So for still photos, which there was nobody that only shoots video, right? Everybody shoots stills. How many of you have this? Good. How old are you? Does anybody have one that's older than about two years? You might need to get a new one. <laughs> the color will fade over time. If you never, ever use it, it's probably going to last longer, obviously, because it's protected. If you use it all the time, it gets exposed to light, and any color that it gets exposed to light fades with time. So as it ages, the color is less accurate. That's the case with anything that's color. Um, the other thing that can happen, and this happens to me a lot, is I'll give it to my model or whoever I'm photographing. I'll say, hold this for me, and they put their fingers on it. I'm like, no, don't put your fingers on the color patches. So that also, you get the oils, that's going to change the color. So if you want it to last as long as possible, don't let anybody touch the patches. Don't lick them, no matter how good they look. <laughs> don't blow your nose on it. Just nothing. And keep it closed and protected, except when you're using it. And even though you can't tell if it's two years old, odds are it's time to get a new one. And it's not just because I love x right. It's just. I want you to, everybody to succeed. All right, so in addition to that, we've got the classic Macbeth color chart that's 40 years old this year. Do we know what day? 
40 years old in like three months. Everybody bake a cake. Um, so this, which is the sort of the nuts and bolts of it. Then we have this, which is you've got your color chart. You've got a gradient from white to black so that you can check your contrast and exposure. If you look and your white is blown out, you know your exposure is too hot. If your black is losing detail, it's too dark. It allows you to get a sense of it uh, quickly, if you're, especially if you're shooting tethered or if you have gamut warning on in your camera. And then they have the patches here, which are gray except with a blue cast and a warm cast. So if you want to quickly do a photograph and you want it just warm a little, you can click on the blue one. Yeah, the blue one, which will make it warm. Or if you want to cool it down, you can click on the cool ones, which will make it cooler. I'm sorry, you can click on the warm ones, which will make it cooler. It's the opposite, just like color negative printing, which nobody does anymore. Make sense to everybody? And then it is, the last thing is that you have this if you want to do a custom white balance in camera. So if you're shooting video, there are people that do custom white balances with stills. Um, I don't bother because I'm always shooting raw, and I'm going to shoot this and do it right in the processing. And then just to go over everything else before, the Color Checker Video Passport has the little patch for custom white balance again. It's got this for focus, especially in video where you often don't have as much light and you may not have enough light to get a good focus. This, with this contrast, it helps tremendously. You have a white, gray, and black to check your exposure again. The black on this is a glossy black. So it, it's a deeper black. It gets you a true black. The normal black, which is a paper black, is a deep black, but it's not, it's not going to be true zero unless it's out. This one you can get, you can check black is black. Unless you do something like this and you reflect things in it. I'm assuming that this, some angle here, it's reflecting. So if you do this and you point it up and it's reflecting the sky so you can see a sheen to it, that's not going to be black. You have to just make sure to angle it so that it's not reflecting. Make sense? so quiet out there. And then you have this, which is a different color patch system than this one. It's close, but it's different. It's, this is optimized for video. Uh, and then the color checker video, not passport. Passport sized, not passport sized. That's, that's the secret trick to, to remembering. Uh, the nice big custom white balance. That again is spectrally neutral, which reminds me, I have seen because I when I do things like this, I watch a lot of what other people say so that I can see things that I disagree with or things that make sense. I have seen people that do video say, in your custom white balance, just grab anything white, pick up a piece of paper, get somebody's white shirt, whatever, get anything white, it'll be fine. Don't do that. I don't care how, how experienced they are. I don't know how, care how much longer they've been doing video than me. Don't do that, because you don't know how white it is. A piece of paper that looks white is almost definitely not white. It's got a cast to it. It could have a bluing agent. It could have a whitening agent. It could be a warm white. To your eye, it looks white, but you have no idea. And then additionally, some things with colors, these are designed to not do this, but under different light sources, some things look like different colors. They're not spectrally neutral. So this is neutral under any at least reasonable light source. There's probably something that exists in the world that it would not be neutral. I don't know, the light of a glowing eel at 20,000 feet below in the Marianas Trench, maybe it wouldn't be neutral, I don't know. But under anything reasonable, this is going to be spectrally neutral. That's not always the case with anything you pick up. And that's really important because if you're going to go to the effort to make things neutral and do it properly, you might as well do it properly. Like, why bother to get things 85% of the way when you can go ahead and do 99 or 100%? I, I can't think of a good reason. And then, additionally, this has skin tone patches, black to white to check your exposure. 
these patches that help you uh, check for color cast. So if you look at this and you're like, boy, that yellow seems green, you know that you have a cast in your video. And then the glossy black, the matte black, the gray, the white to check exposure. All right, and I never, ever use the color checker passport. You can tell. So I'm going to go over quickly um, how to use the true magic of the color checker passport photo. So the thing that a lot of people do is they use this, and they buy it because people told them they should, like me. I have friends who bought this because I told them that they should. And I told them how unbelievably awesome it is. And just so you know, I've been saying this for years before I was even a Colorado. Before I actually said, you know what, you should be a Colorado. I was telling people how awesome that this is, because it is one of the coolest things that exists in the world. So people I know have bought this, and they don't use it, or they only use it for a gray card. And it is great as a gray card. It's protected. It stays clean. The gray cards, I have friends who should know better, who have gray cards that they keep like taped to the inside of their camera bag or you know, in a dirty envelope, and it gets scuffed up, and it gets dirty, and it gets dusty. And then it's not really gray anymore. It's not really neutral. It's neutral-ish. It's better than just picking up a yellow piece of paper and trying to pretend that's neutral. But it's not actually gray. It's just close. And again, if we can be right instead of close, why not be right? So using the gray, car, the gray part, that's great. But it's got this whole color ch checker system, which will allow you to build a custom profile for your camera. The custom profile, I kind of go overboard. Most people are not as extreme as I am. But if I'm shooting, there's a catalog I shoot for every year, for example. Every single shot, every shot I build a profile for. Most people think that that's overboard, and they could be right. But why not err on the side of caution? Um, when you change your lighting, you're changing the, the way that colors respond. So even different modifiers, it's different. You get your old softbox, it's yellow. You get your new softbox, it's white. You get one from this company, it's whatever. And that company, it's different. The inside's silver, the inside's gold, the inside's white. It changes. You change the power on your strobes, the color changes. You change your lens, the coating changes. A lot of that is overkill. I, I have seen people feel like you don't necessarily need to do that. But it's easy enough, why not? So I end up with you know, 60 profiles for the catalog, but it's easy to do. So you start out with a picture of the color checker passport under the lighting that you're going to use. It's very important that you're, it's getting the light that is on your subject. So if, for example, this young man were holding it up so it was ref reflecting a lot of sky, that would be not super right. It would be close, but you want it to be the light that's hitting your subject. You don't want it to be that random light that's reflecting that you don't even see. You want it to be hitting your subject. Um, additionally, well, it's not incredibly critical that the color checker be sharp, it's going to make it a lot easier. The reason is there's these little crop marks. And if the software can't find those, it, you have to do it another way, which takes more time, which I'm also going to show you. But it's a lot simpler if it's sharp. As long as the color is clean and nothing's in the way, you can make it work, in my experience. But again, why, why make things harder for yourselves? So you start out importing into Lightroom much like this. See, it's still building previews because I foolishly imported like a 1,000 pictures to do this for no good reason instead of just the two I needed. Um, so here we are in Lightroom, in the library. We've selected that color checker passport photo. Uh, I have now gone to the develop menu, taken the little eyedropper that's here. I'm white balancing. So first thing I do, get it neutral. And it works great for that. And honestly, there are, I shoot portraits mostly. Sometimes the absolute perfect color you get by doing this profile, 
I don't do. Sometimes I don't need to. But any time that the color really, really matters, anything that you're shooting where it needs to be right, nothing is going to be as right as this. The upper left is a white. You want it more of a middle gray. So I use this one typically. If you use the upper left, it's, there may not be enough information. And actually, there's an error that you can get. If you've overexposed your color chart, it can't build a profile for you because the, some of the patches are out of gamut. They're too bright. So make sure that it's correctly exposed. If you're not sure, do a little bracket. There are times when my shot's a little hot and I know it, so I'll do like three shots of the color checker at different exposures just to make sure that I have something. Because if the colors are clipped, it can't do its magic because the information isn't there. So we have Photoshop, Lightroom, Capture One. I'm going to tell you something that makes me sad. I use Capture One for tethering, and I use Capture One anytime I don't need to build a custom profile. However, Capture One does not support custom profiles. I have friends who work there, and every time I talk to them, I'm like, you guys need to do this. And I've got, I'm slowly converting people over there. So eventually, maybe it will filter to the Danish, and they'll actually do it. <laughs> I'm hoping. Anytime you see somebody from Capture One, tell them, boy, I really wish you supported the color checker passport photo. So the white balance, for sure. Um, when color really, really matters, I, I just can't. It, I shoot with Sony cameras. It works great with Sony cameras, but you can't use this profile. And you'll see why it makes a difference. For those of you who use Photoshop or Lightroom, it's still Adobe Camera Raw is the engine. And I, there's two different ways to do it. One is through Lightroom. One is through a standalone X-Rite uh, profile builder. I actually will show you that as well. Those of you who's Capture One, I love this software. I, I so want them. Maybe if we all fly over there together and camp out in front with signs. All right, so the, for those of you using Lightroom, the eyedropper is here. It's not there now because it's been selected. Select the eyedropper, click on the, the neutral gray. I use this one, but any of those should be fine. Place it right in the uh... Yeah, so you click the eyedropper, you click on there. So why the, the reason this thing is up is because the eyedropper is over that. It just with the screenshot, it disappeared. And what you're seeing is, I guess that's a 25 pixel section that's all the same tone. It's all that target neutral. You click on that. It applies that neutral. All right. Then, now it's applied. So you can see, if you look at the skin tone of the kid, it's a little red. I don't know how calibrated everything. Well, I don't have the profile on here. So you're going to have to believe me sometimes, because whatever profile this is is not installed on my computer. But this is too red. This is neutral, even though it looks a little green. Um, it doesn't look green on my computer, which is profile. So then you've installed the x right Color Checker Passport photo software, which comes with the Passport and is also downloadable if, for some reason, you don't have that disk. And they just upgraded to 1.1, I think, because I updated yesterday, 1.1, and it works and with 1.1, it works great with the, my 42 megapixel files. Um, so you go to File, Export with Preset, Color Checker Passport. If you've installed the software, that plugin should be there. File, Export with Preset, Color Checker Passport. You do that. It's going to ask you to name the profile. DNG is digital negative. Just pretend that, that it doesn't say that. It's not really relevant. Um, I use part of the file name typically. So this was for game sportswear in 2013. The item number was 518Y. So I used 13 underscore 518Y. So if I shoot 
I don't know if I shot this in 2014. Sometimes I shoot the same things every year. I can know which, which was which. So you're naming the profile so that later you can find it. It defaults to untitled profile which isn't going to be great if you just keep overriding your untitled profile with another untitled profile. Whatever system allows you to figure it out is key. Another thing that is important about this is each camera is going to have its own profile. So if you shoot with an A7R2 and you build a profile, that profile will show up in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw if the raw file is from that camera. If it's from, you shoot with an A7R2, and then you borrow your friend's 5D Mark, whatever it is now, 3, 5D Mark 3, and shoot with that, the Sony profile is not going to show up for the RAW files for the Canon, and vice versa, or Nikon, or even different models from the same manufacturer. You have your A7R2 and your A7S. You're not going to see the same profiles for both because the profile is specific to a camera which is useful because you don't, there's no reason to have access to those other profiles for another camera. It's going to be wrong. All right, so you name the profile. Um, it does its magic, which I didn't show you the, the moment where you wait a minute or two for it to figure it out. But what it does is it looks in the frame. It finds this. It finds the crop marks, and it builds a profile. Now, aside from the error you can get if you've overexposed, you can also have an error if it's not sharp and it can't find the crop marks. I believe that that's why. Um, or if it's too small. So I think 20%, 30%, there's a rule of thumb for how big it should be that I completely ignore. Um, sometimes it's big enough, and sometimes I have to do it a different way. So you can either crop around it and then rerun the thing, and it can find it, or you can use the standalone software. So the profile has been correctly generated, successfully generated. Lightroom must be restarted to activate the profile. That's because Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw or anything looks at all the profiles when it launches. And everything that's in that profile folder, it loads. Anything that gets added while it's open, it doesn't know to look. It's just not that smart. Make sense? All right, so this is, all right, here we go. So this is uh, the file with the Adobe standard profile. This is the file with the 13 underscore 15 Y profile. You're going to see a side by side in a minute. And where that is, if you go to your develop module, you scroll all the way down to camera calibration. It's, the, I believe, the very last thing on the develop module. You have process and profile. Profile is a drop-down menu. And depending on what you're shooting and how many profiles you've built, there could be one thing. Like before I added this profile, because I, I haven't used this camera in a long time on my current installation of Lightroom, Adobe Standard was the only profile that showed up. And then I added this, now there's two. So you select the profile that's right, and it applies. And then, I didn't go into this step, but you could then select everything you wanted to and just hit sync, and it will apply, apply that profile to everything. You should also do that with the white balance. I skipped that step because I didn't think of it, frankly. All right, so alternatively, this is the Color Checker Passport standalone software. To use this, you need a DNG file. I think one camera manufacturer, or maybe, does native DNGs. So that means you have to make a DNG. That's another step I didn't think to include. But So if you're using Adobe Camera Raw, you open your file, you save it. When you go to the save system, you can select DNG as the format to save to. You've got TIFFs, PSDs, JPEGs, JPEG 2000s, all that stuff. One of those options is DNG which is digital negative. So it's the Adobe raw file standard that they created hoping that other people would adopt it as a standard, and nobody does. But so you take your raw file, you save it as a DNG. Makes sense. Everybody's opened a raw file and then saved it as something, right? 
Otherwise, you've got a bunch of raw files just collecting dust and wondering what's on them. Um, so you save it as a DNG. Once you've done that, you open this software, you drag the DNG file into here from wherever it is. And I did this one so that you could see how things can go wrong. So I dragged this file in. It says a color checker could not be detected in this image. The reason is because it's about this big, which is just a little smaller than they recommend, like a 200th of the frame, a little smaller than ideal. So you say, OK. You zoom in, and it's also not sharp. So that could have contributed too. You zoom in, and it has this grid that just get superimposed over the middle of the frame. And what you do is you drag things around until it lines up. So you put the little green dots over the crop marks. You make sure that all of the boxes are clean, meaning if this box has white and a little bit of black and a little bit of blue, you don't want that because it doesn't know what to do. It's looking for white. And it's all confused because there's all this stuff, and it gives you a terrible profile. But if you line everything up properly, it should work. It's just you just drag it to make it work. All right, then you get your save window. Because this is my profile, you can see I have a couple of custom profiles. There's the scroll bar, so it's double that. Just every once in a while, I clean out the really old ones. Uh, so you save it, whatever you want. This one was 13 underscore 1800 underscore pink underscore one. And then, again, this profile has been created successfully. So now if you're using Bridge or Adobe Camera Raw and not Lightroom, you can use this software, which is a standalone, and again, installs when you, inst when you install the X-Rite Color Checker Passport system. And it will put it into the same profile system that you would use in Bridge or Adobe Camera Raw, separate from Lightroom. It's the same system. There's also a tab. I did never use Bridge, so it didn't occur to me to include that. But you have an option. You've got all your tabs. One of the tabs is for color and profiles. You go down near the bottom, and again, just like in Lightroom, you select that profile. It's the same processing engine as Lightroom. It's just functional. It functions a little differently. All right, and just as an example, so before the profile, after the profile. This is a more subtle one, and the next one, uh, I am still not sure how it could possibly be so different, but, but that's why I picked it. So the red, I think we can all agree that red is redder, right? It's a, it's a deeper red. The green's a little different. Some of it, you know, the black a little different. The blue is barely different at all. It depends on your camera, your lighting. Every camera sensor and raw processor you know, handles things differently. So depending on what you're shooting and what you're shooting with, what it does with the profile is going to be different. You shoot with camera A, and you shoot pickles. It makes no difference. But you shoot with camera B, and you shoot pickles. It makes a huge difference. It just, it's just different. Make sense? All right, this is the one. This is the same white balance. It's the same file, processed twice, once with the profile, once without, without changing the white balance. I think we can agree that the one on the right, the color looks a little better. Um, I also picked it because I hate that color. That is one of the worst colors to photograph. It's just awful. Um, but this client has a lot of that stuff. And they've never had anybody shoot it and get it anywhere near as accurate as I do with this. So hopefully they'll just keep calling me. But that's, that's a huge difference. If you're shooting a catalog where you know, the, ultimately the four color printing I have no control over. But the closer you can get it on pond delivery, the better. And color matters. You know, somebody's buying a blue sweater, they want to know that what it looks like in the catalog is pretty close to what they're going to get. That compared to this, it's hugely different. Aside from just the yellow, his skin tone, the jeans, the boots, like everything. 
And all it is, same white balance with and without the profile. It's one of the most extreme differences I've seen. But that's why I picked it, because what's the fun of, if you look really close, that blue is a tiny bit different. But we're, that's not fun. All right, make sense to everybody? Is everybody now going to start using the color checker passport photo and do the profile? Because it's awesome. Do you see why it's one of my favorite things that exists in the world? For what, 100, 100 bucks, I think, right? For 100 bucks? Yeah. If you, you keep it for two years, so that's like five, six, six dollars a month or something. I mean, how can you go wrong? All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about video. So the color checker chart has been a standard for years and years and years. They've used it in video for a long time. Uh, there is some software that supports the photo. I'm going to show you one of them. Um, and then additionally, there is the color checker video, which was designed specifically for video needs. Having that, that glossy black, having the focus, From this side, they look the same. Ah, having the focus, having the custom white, having that, you know, it's a different, it's different because it's designed for a different need. And then this again. So the color checker video, because it's a different color patch, there's third part, there is some third party compatibility. So there's a program called Color Finale that works with Final Cut Pro. It's a plugin. That has that patch built in. And if you're shooting with color and importing that patch, it knows, and a little like uh, shooting with stills, it knows what to look for and it will correct. Uh, additionally, there's a program called 3T, 3D LUT, which is lookup table uh, creator that works with Photoshop, After Effects, Premiere Pro, DaVinci Resolve, and Final Cut Pro. And then additionally, there are, is more support coming. But when it will be, nobody tells me these things. It's never as fast as you want, but it always happens. So I'm going to show you uh, how to use the traditional, this one, the traditional color checker in a video software. Um, I'm actually using, the one I'm showing you is DaVinci Resolve, which I don't normally use. but. DaVinci Resolve is free. So if you just want to play, you can download DaVinci Resolve. DaVinci Resolve is free to download. So if you just want to get your feet wet with video before you start looking into other things, it's an option. They're all, every video software is different. And I find trying to go from one to, to the other to be really confusing. But it's there. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of. Let me see if I like this before I spend a lot of money. All right, so this is DaVinci Resolve. Um, and I included all the steps because it took me a while to figure it out. So you import your files, your video files, into Resolve. You can see my project is named X-Rite Resolve Test. And I have two video uh, clips that I shot, w both with the wrong color, one with extremely wrong color. So then you go, so when you import down here, you're in media. Then you click on edit. Edit brings you to your timeline. And you drag your files into the timeline. So I dragged one, dragged the other. Now you have two files in your timeline. Once they're in the timeline, it's easy to, they're easy to work with. Uh, then you go to color down here. Makes sense, color to fix color. If you're a super intense video colorist, which I am not, you've got all this information, your waveform. I'm a still photographer that shoots video. If I need intense stuff done, I give it to an editor. So I'm going over the kinds of stuff that I think any of you might use. There's a lot of information and a lot of things that can be done if you want to put the time and effort into learning it. It's just you know, life is a balance. What do you, 
you can learn this or you can learn that. I can take more pictures or I can spend the next 30 days learning to be a mediocre colorist. Or I could just hire somebody when I need it and do a custom white balance so that you don't need much. What I'm going to show you, especially with this one, if you did things properly, nothing should ever be that far off. This is uh, indoors in the shade, in the shadow, indirect sun on a tungsten white balance to just totally screw it up. All right, so I've now selected the one that is daylight balanced, but not shade, so it's a little off. There it is over here, and you just click on it, and it shows up there. So you have this little eyedropper on the lower left. You click on the eyedropper, you have this drop-down window, qualifier, power window, image wipe, dust removal, color chart. Not surprisingly, you select color chart for the color chart. Then it comes with this little thing. Looks a lot like a color chart that's clear. And you start dragging it to overlap. It warps. Again, just like uh, with the X-Rite software, line up the dots with the, with the crop marks. Make sure each little patch is clean. And then you click Match here. And it knows. So if you look, it's got this. That's the color chart. Just like that. You, you click match, and it says, OK, this is what it's supposed to be. That's what it is. And it matches it. So if you look, it's got a little cleaner, right? It's a little greenish here. It's cleaner there. Again, I, I didn't profile this monitor with my laptop. Um, did everybody profile their computers? Wait, two people's hands went up? Let's try that again. How many people profile their monitors? OK, all the rest of you profile your monitors. They're, it's not expensive. It's like, I don't know, 100 bucks for the cheapest one? You can get the X-Rite and the Color Monkey as a bundle. I use the i1, but the Color Monkey is fine. Um, if you don't profile your monitor, that takes us to a whole nevel, another level of importance, because the color you're looking at on your monitor is not accurate. If you've white balanced correctly, if you've clicked that gray patch, and you look and you're like, wow, everything seems yellow after I click the gray patch, that means your monitor's off. And you need to trust this more than your eyes if your monitor's not calibrated. But just calibrate your monitor. It's, it's not, the thing is last forever. All right, now we're going to do this one that's way off. And you're going to understand the importance of doing the correct custom white balance to begin with. So this is the blue one. So before, after. And it's, it's pretty good. But especially, I should have done a slide with the two compared. Um, it's still just not quite right. And the reason it's not quite right is it was so far off that you can only correct so far. Because it's like a JPEG, you can't take something that's way over here and make it perfect. If it's here, you can get it perfect. If it's way over here, you can get it to here. But you're not going to be able to get it exactly right because if it was a raw file, you'd be fine. But because it's essentially a JPEG, you're limited. It's still way better. That I think we can all agree a little bit better than this, unless you really like blue things, in which case, maybe this is what you want to do. But again, I'd rather start with neutral, and then if I want it to be blue, start it correct, and then make it blue, rather than start it blue and wish that I could make it correct. And you know what? Let's talk about color sources a little, too. So in here, we've got these LEDs. Color in light being emitted from things is different colors, right? LEDs are different colors. If you choose to use LEDs for your lighting, there's a big difference between inexpensive LEDs and more expensive LEDs. And I made this mistake early on because I saw how cheap I could get cheap LEDs, and I'm like, awesome. 
why spend $500 when I can spend $40? And then I learned that the color is all over the place. I have this little small case with five LEDs in it, none of which match one another. I borrowed a friend's color meter. I put tape to figure out what the corrections were. No two of them are alike, which is kind of OK if you're using one light. But once you combine things, it becomes an issue. So when you're shooting, if you're combining light, you can correct a lot. And you can get the light correct on your subject. But if you're using something that's, say, 5,900 degrees Kelvin here, and then the fill light is 3,200 degrees, something is going to be blue and something is going to be warm. You can get a piece in the middle that's correct, but you can't magically make 3,200 and 5,900 the same. You sort of can in Photoshop if you want to start getting into masking and put way too much work into it. Uh, but that's important to keep in mind. Additionally, and this is getting way too nerdy. I can get way more nerdy than I need. Um, some light sources are not full spectrum. So daylight, full spectrum, it's got all the colors. If you're, say, under sodium vapor lights outside, which are very warm, but also not full spectrum. So you can correct those with a gray card to neutral, but there's colors missing. You may or may not see them. But it's like, you know when you have your histogram and you do crazy things to your file, and you've got banding in your histogram where there's just pieces missing? It's essentially like that. If you're using a light source that's not, that doesn't have all the colors, there just are things that aren't there. And you, you may not notice. Usually, it's not enough that you're going to notice. But for those of us who care, it's important to be aware of that. So just because I am way too nerdy with. All right. So let me, who wants to come up here? And I'm going to take a quick picture of you. And then we're going to do a custom white balance on it. All right, he, waved his, he raised his hand first. You waited too long. You had your chance. Let's see. Let's sit right here. Let's uh, turn this way. All right, so in a meter, at 4 to 60th at 800. All right, 60th at F4. ISO 800. How many of you use light meters? So sad. You should use light meters. It's better. Was, was that? Yes. Do I use a light meter frequently in all situations? I use a light meter anytime I can. When I don't use a light meter is if I'm walking around outside, for example. Like I was just in Machu Picchu. I did not bother with a light meter because I'm shooting that direction, now I'm shooting that direction, now I'm shooting that direction. I'm using the in camera. I'm shooting on aperture priority. I'm just letting it go. Anytime I'm shooting in an environment that I'm controlling, I'm using a light meter. You can shoot and then look and adjust, but you can't. There's no camera that you can trust the LCD. I mean, they're all pretty close, but they're not 100% right. They could be too bright. They could be too dark. Some cameras will uh, change the brightness of the LCD depending on the conditions. So you might think it's right, but it made the screen brighter because it knows it's dark where you are. So what you're seeing is brighter than the file. The color is not going to be 100%. You, a light meter. Much more accurate. I, so I, I also use a light meter for video. Uh, depending on your camera, if you have zebras, you can do things like with this. You can, if your camera allows it, and it tends to be more higher end cameras, there's something called zebras. And you can say the zebra is set at this level. And if you know what that level is then, and how it correlates to the, the tone on the color checker video, you can set the zebras on some cameras so that Say the zebras show up when you're at this tone. So you hold this up, you adjust your exposure until the zebras show up, which means that they're at that tone so that you know what the exposure is. Or you could just use a meter. If you're 
a serious video person, most of them do that. If you're on the other hand, if you're on a movie set, they're using meters. It just it depends. If you're like shooting for TV news, most of those people they have everything set. It it means this. They do this. They're done. Um, I, maybe I shouldn't say most of them. Some of them. Most of anything is probably. None of us should say most about anything. Some people do that. I I like meters because because they just work. They're accurate. So. So let me, I'm going to shoot one. All right, so don't put your fingers on it. Hold that up here. All right. So I'm not tethered. Uh, would you guys like me to use Lightroom for this, or would you like to see the standalone software in Adobe Camera Raw in Bridge? All right, more people say Lightroom. Sorry for the rest of you. Uh, okay, well, I'm starting Lightroom while it's making funny noises. Uh, somebody asked about color meters. I, I think color meters are a fantastic tool. Uh, I don't. They're not necessarily what you want to use to figure out what white balance to set your camera at. But what they're terrific for is matching lights. So if you are shooting in a situation where there's a lot of different light sources, if you have a color meter, you can pick what you want to match. Let's say you want everything to be daylight. So 5,500 degrees Kelvin, no green magenta shift. This light is 42 degrees, 4,200 degrees Kelvin. So you know you need to add some blue. 4,200, it would be like a half blue, half CTB. Add it, now you match. Then this other light is a fluorescent, so it needs, let's say it needs a quarter CTO and some minus green. So you can match everything with a color meter because you can measure each light source separately. So it's terrific for that. Um, as a what color balance should I put in the camera, if you're shooting in RAW and using this, it, it's not necessary. Make sense? All right, so we've imported the two pictures. I have to look this way because it's not mirroring. We go to develop. Actually, we're going to do this so that I can see it nice and big. Uh, we, you don't have to be careful. You can see there's shadow from his hands on it, on the color checker down here. Fortunately, there isn't here. But if these shadows were on the patches we need, that would be a problem. Whoops. All right, so you go to develop. Let, the, let it think for a minute for no good reason. Developing is hard. It involves personal growth. All right, so we select the eyedropper. It's really hard to do this when you look in that direction. We're going to go up here, pick target neutral. All right, so we just white balanced it. If you pick the wrong thing, so let's say like that, someone might look at that beige curtain and think that's white. You click it, that's not right. I think we, everybody can see that. You want something that's actually designed to be neutral. All right, so you go to File, Export with Preset, Color Checker Passport. We're just going to call this X-Rite test, except that I can't spell. Save. And we'll see if it's big enough. It may or may not be. Processing profile. This profile has been generated successfully. So if I'm moving closer rather than zooming, and now I am affecting the light either with, let's say I'm wearing blue and that blue is reflecting on to the color checker, that's going to impact it. Or if I'm blocking some of the light. So you just have to be aware of that if, you're, if you choose to do it that way. So I did not turn it into a DNG, because if you're using Lightroom, you don't need to. Lightroom handles it all on its own as part of the plugin. If you are using the color checker software standalone, then you do need to convert it to a DNG first. To use the Photoshop 
to use it in Photoshop, you have to use the Color Checker standalone, standalone software. Um, it, because it doesn't have a plug-in uh, for Adobe Camera Raw that, in that way. All right, so it's been created. All right, so now we're in the develop window. Scroll down, color, camera calibration. We have Adobe Standard, camera clear, camera deep, camera landscape, camera, I don't ever use any of those. And x ray test. So we apply x ray test. Everybody see there's a difference? Standard, x ray test. Like the colors are richer, they're more natural. The, uh, the standard, it's, it feels a little flat, the color. Um, and Adobe standard is Adobe trying to make something that's good. Uh, it's just that because cameras vary so much and lighting situations vary, you have a much more powerful tool when you build a custom profile. Then we just select both of them. You hit sync, make sure that white balance and all the color stuff is combined. Uh, I like to do lens profile corrections too. Synchronize. Yep, and everything is matched. All right, did everybody follow all of that? So there are, and this is where I'm crazy and some people aren't. Um, what you can do, what some people do, is if you have a way that you normally shoot, um, you can have a handful of, of profiles pre-built for that. So let's say, what camera do you shoot with? So you have your 5D Mark II with, let's say, the 8518. And if you sh mostly shoot with that, and you mostly shoot using a certain lighting setup, you can build a profile and just apply that profile in that setup. And it's going to be certainly much better than uh, not applying it. Um, like I said, I shoot portraits. And sometimes if the blue or green or whatever that they're wearing isn't quite right, it, nobody cares. Like The skin tone needs to look good, but the rest of it doesn't matter. So sometimes I will just use the, the white balance. Um, if I'm just going to use white balance, I process and capture one instead. But any time that the color really, really matters, I use the profile. And you can have, I do have a few profiles I, that I have for certain situations. But any time it really matters, I just build a new one. Would I build a new profile if I change lenses in the middle of the session? I probably would. It depends on, there's some things that it depends on. So I'm shooting with the Sony a7R2 with the Sony Zeiss lens. If I then switched to, let's say I used an adapter and a Canon lens, I would definitely build a new profile because the coatings are different. The lens coatings are different. The way that the lens is built is different. You know, lenses have a color. It's usually subtle, but there's a difference between them. And it may be so subtle that you don't see it. But um, if you switch manufacturers, you're much more likely to see it. If I switch to another Sony lens, maybe not. All right. Thanks all for coming. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.